All right, and welcome to your lecture on radio telemetry. Um, this is a important topic. It's an important technique that we use to learn about um, wildlife and wild systems. Um, it can be an overused technique, and so this lecture is going to really focus on the appropriate uses of radio telemetry. And so today we're going to um, learn a few things. We're going to start off with talking about exactly what is radio telemetry. Then we're going to move on to how do we use it, the applications and the considerations we need to make about the effects that radio telemetry may have on animals. We're going to talk about how we use it, the actual tags and receivers in the process of finding animals. Um, we're also going to talk about what we can do with the data, so kind of the after um, processing and questions that can be asked and uh, considerations that you really want to consider um, if you're going to use this as a study method. So what is radio telemetry? Um, the simple definition is that it is the use of radio waves for transmitting information from a distant instrument to a device that indicates or records the measurements. Um, and this process, this technology actually has a lot of uses. They're not necessarily all wildlife. Um, I talked to a lot of people who use telemetry in biomedical usage. So you can have like a heart, um, an implant in your heart that actually monitors you know, the, your heart rate and your beats. And that information can be relayed back to the hospital that can help with care. Um, there's also radio telemetry uses of power grids. Um, your RFID chip in your credit card is basically a little radio transmitter. Obviously, your mobile phone um, is an application of this uh, technology. But where it's really found a lot of ground um, for us, obviously, is in environmental sensing and specifically in tracking animal movement. So for our purposes, what I'm calling wildlife telemetry is any time that we're putting a tag on an animal that allows us um, electronically to re either recapture or refine that animal or identify it later. Um, so radio telemetry has a lot of uses in wildlife ecology. However, it's not what's called, it's not a panacea. Don't just slap radio tags on every single animal. You really need to con carefully consider the questions that can be answered um, using telemetry and also questions that can be used answered in other ways. So those passive techniques, things like genetics. Um, for example, I really can't think of a good reason for most studies to put radio transmitters on um, lions in national parks in Africa. They are so, they're generally very easy to find um, because the savannas are so open, there's high detection rates, there's numbers of them, so you don't really lose track of them. Um, so often the questions that you want answered, you don't necessarily need a radio collar. Um, and so we'll talk about more question, more specific questions, but just I want to start off with saying that this is not a technology that is a, um, a end-all, be-all answer to your questions. And there's usually cheaper ways um, and less invasive and manpower intensive ways of answering questions. So there are applications um, if you want to know local movements, if you want to see long um, long distance migrations. It helps you track very detailed space use. We can study resource selection. We can even look at behaviors, survival, and even fecundity. So there's lots of different ways that we can study, use this um, information. Now, before you even really start using telemetry, you need to make a lot of decisions. Um, the number one consideration that you need to make is the effect that your tag or even your study design is going to have on the animals that you're studying. Remember, we have moral and scientific obligations to justify the use of this technology and to minimize stress on animals. Remember that if you have a super, if your radio collar is causing undue stress to your animal, you're going to get junk data beyond the fact that you're, you know, you're harming an animal for really no purpose. Your science is also not going to be good if you aren't taking into careful consideration some of the um, things that we're going to talk about. 
So when you're tagging an animal, when you're putting a radio collar on, um, this is kind of um, common to all sorts of times when you actually physically capture an animal, is that there are acute and chronic things that may happen as a result of that capture. So the acute things are that capture myopathy, which is the animal dying as a result of the stress from capture and, and handling. Uh, there's also predation risks. If you um, drug an animal, especially a prey species, and then just let it go, it might end up you know, being much more prone to predation. Um, also, one, we, once we were noticing that we were misnetting migrating songbirds. And then we noticed that there was a raptor who just came and sat in a tree next to us. And that raptor could have been picking off the birds that we were releasing. So you want to be really careful about the direct effects of your capture. Um, and all the, and all, also trauma. Um, like we talked about in our capture lab, the act of putting capturing animals can be traumatic. Like they can actually receive traumatic injuries in a foothold um, if they don't get captured correctly in your box trap, uh, they can hurt themselves trying to escape. So these are all things you need to think about. Do you really want to capture and put your hands on these animals? Um, the other things you want to think about, especially with radio tags, um, bulky ones that may have a lot of uh, weight to them, are the chronic stressors from wearing a, a radio collar. You can reduce animals foraging, especially if the collar is too tight and it restricts kind of that esophagus. Um, you don't want them to be super stressed out by having the collar on and increase the, their grooming. Um, you may also, in some species, uh, create social rejection. You're putting a tag on an animal that the other animals can see, and they might actually ostracize that critter. Um, and also, the radio tag itself may injure the animal. Um, I'm going to tell you a story, and just as a warning, the next slide has a kind of graphic image. Uh, but this monkey that you see here is a rhesus macaque with a radio collar on. Um, there was a graduate student a couple years ago at UF who was studying the ecology of the rhesus macaques, and she wanted to specifically look at their movements. So she radio collared some of the macaques that were living on the Silver River. Um, she actually needed a veterinarian to do this because they are a non-human primate, so she actually had to go above and beyond for her iacuc. Um, and despite that, not fit properly and caused injury to that monkey. Uh, this is an actual picture. I actually pulled it off of a animal rights website. Um, you can see that the collar rubbed her, this animal's neck raw um, and it got infected. And this was seen by the public, actually. And this was taken from a cruise boat um, in Silver Springs. Um, and this researcher, her... Um, her project was completely shut down. Uh, animal rights activists actually called death threats into the school. Uh, she had to move for a little bit, change her uh, outgoing voicemail messages, all because of um, kind of some, incon you know, not thinking about all of the considerations and the injuries that you might cause to these animals. The other thing that I want to point out with this, too, is that you don't really want to put radio collars on animals that are highly visible to people. It upsets people and you might end up um, with more um, public interest than you want to deal with. Uh, certainly that was the case in this example. Okay, so when you're planning a telemetry study, there are two main features that make the telemetry system work. You have the receiver that receives the radios and the radio signals, and obviously you have the radio um, or item that you're placing on the animal that's going to collect data. We're going to go in detail into all of these, um, but the big major considerations uh, for your receivers are the cost of them. You, they can run, you know, 500 to several thousand dollars, and what you're buying with that is the specificity and also the power. How far away from an animal can you be before you detect it? Um, with radios, you really want to think about the fit of the radio. Um, like I said, you don't want to have any injuries to the animals. So you want to make sure they fit snugly and they don't wear or um, choke the animals. You're going to have to think about size, battery life, and also the quality of data that you want. Um, 
those are all considerations when choosing a radio tag to use. Now, there are a lot of different types of radio tags. I might go between calling them tags and calling them call callers, um, but pretty much anything that you put on an animal that helps you relocate it, I'm gonna call it a radio collar or a radio tag. Um, so here you see a wide variety, all the way from the more typical like necklaces and collars that you've seen. Those run from, they can be put on anything as small as a, as a rat, um, up to huge radio collars that can go on elephants. Um, also in birds, it's much more common um, to use these backpack attachments. Sometimes you can actually give it, you can glue it just onto the backpack, onto the back of the animal, or you can um, use little um, nylon straps and like put it over the animal's arm so it actually becomes a backpack. Um, we also have glue-on attachments. Uh, these are also called tail-mounted. So you just pick off a couple feathers um, on the back or on the tail and glue this direct, glue them directly to an animal's skin. Uh, these are a lot, uh, they're not gonna last very long because of their small size, so the battery's gonna die quickly. Um, and also animals will tend to preen them off much quicker if, the, if it's glued on rather than, you know, ratcheted onto an animal's neck. Um, there's also wing tags that you can put on birds. Um, here, this is clamped around the arm bone um, of the animal, so that's a permanent tag. They're not gonna be able to preen that off. Um, we also have implant radio transmitters. Uh, so some species, like especially snakes, need or alligators, you need to put implants in them because they don't have any place to really attach a radio. Um, so this is actually implanted into the body cavity of the snake or of the animal that you're interested in. And this antenna comes all the way out of the animal and that is sets off the signals. So you can see that there's, a, there's kind of a, a tag or an attachment method for every critter. And yet again, you gotta think about what kind of animal do you have? What's gonna be the best um, attachment method for your radio? So every radio collar, if it, even if it's a tail-mounted um, implant or a collar, is gonna have some of the same basic components. You're gonna need a power source. So usually that's a battery. However, they've recently been coming out with um, solar-powered ones. They actually have a little solar power, uh, solar panel that can um, help charge the battery. Um, you're also gonna need have electric circuitry that you know keeps the um, actual radio running. You're gonna have an antenna. Um, you can have either a whip antenna, like this one, the external antenna, or you can actually have a loop, so it actually just becomes part of this, uh, the collar. Um, ex external antennas have are stronger, it's easier to pick up that signal, um, but they're prone to loss, especially if you have an animal that might chew or be chewed on. Um, then you might want to use a loop antenna instead. Um, you're also going to want to um, encapsulate all that machinery. So you're going to need some sort of waterproofing agent, some sort of epoxy, but it needs to be biologically inert or and not chewable, so not tasty. Sometimes radio manufacturers will actually put like cayenne pepper or anti-chew uh, material into their epoxy so that animals don't chew on them. So in addition, there are a couple characteristics that when you order your radio tag, your radio manufacturer is gonna to wanna to know. Uh, the first thing is the pulse rate. So how many signals, how many beeps are the, uh, is the radio gonna give off in a given minute? Um, the higher the pulse rate, kind of the easier it is to find the animal and also to home in on it. However, that sucks down battery life. So I've worked on projects where um, my rabbits were at 60 beats per minute, but I've also worked on um, a project where we were doing American Martin and those were at 30 beats per minute. Um, so it's half rate. So it actually goes very slow because they wanted to really extend those battery lives. And they weren't all that concerned about like very accurate or easy homing. It was um, just a better, it was just an easier way to check life 
Um, they'll also want to know the size of the radio and its configuration. So yeah, are you going to use a radio collar or are you going to use a backpack? Um, you'll also have to decide on weight. The rule of thumb is that you never, you want to stay less than three to five percent of the body weight of an animal. Um, so that's not that hard on some of the larger animals like polar bears and things like that can have very large radio collars put on them. But the smaller animals, um, bats, things like that, you need to keep those radios very, very light and you're going to lose um, battery life and also your pulse rate um, in order to keep that because the majority of the weight of these um, radio, the collars are actually the battery. Um, it doesn't take a lot um, to have a little transmitter. It's actually that battery that's taking up a lot of, a lot of the um, weight. So in addition to radio collars, the what we call VHF collars, there are multiple different types of tags. Um, so you can have geolocators, which are, um, which you can see are is an instrument put on this uh, painted bunting, and they actually use the amount of light. They're um, calibrated to the amount of light in the environment, so they can actually figure out where, um, what latitude you are at based upon the ambient light and the um, photo period of that day. So they're a very rough estimate of where an animal is and you can only get latitude, you can't get longitude from that, but they're really helpful for breeding bird um, monitoring. And these don't require a lot of battery, so you can um, put them on animals that are migrating and can't have a lot of um, equipment on them. After a geolocator, you kind of the most, the second most simplest of these tags is the VHF radio. Those are the kind of typical radio collars that we, um, we've been talking about. Your radio, um, your tags might also be able to talk to cell phone towers. So uh, more and more, there are radios that come equipped with cell capabilities so they can talk to cell towers. And the cell tower will triangulate the location of just like the GPS, kind of like the GPS in your phone now. It's basically putting that on our animal. Um, we also have GPS collars where you have just like a GPS unit that's on board in the radio collar that is taking pretty accurate um, GPS points at a set schedule. Or you can have a satellite radio tag where the tag um, communicates with the satellite and they can be tracked either on a schedule or in real time, um, depending upon how much money you want to put into monitoring your satellite tagged animals. So a little bit more on VHF tags. VHF stands for very high frequency. Um, and these are the radios that actually give off a pulse um, in a high megahertz um, bandwidth. Um, and they are the frequency that you are on, that your rap, your animals, uh, this case is a pygmy rabbit, is uh, broadcasting on is usually assigned as part of a grant. Um, you want to coordinate with projects nearby so that you're not double tagging animals with the same radio um, so that you're not accidentally looking for rabbits when you're, when somebody else has tagged a, um, you know, uh, vulture nearby. Um, and so there's some very simple ways that we kind of help to break up that very high frequency range. Uh, that 30 to 50 uh, megahertz range is usually based in aquatic animals. That, um, that 30 to 50 megahertz, they travel easier, better through water, and it's easier to pick them up in, through water, but they don't do as well uh, in terrestrial telemetry. So they're not very common. Um, the 148 to 155, uh, those are dedicated to research, to the use of states and universities. So those are kind of where we've, um, we'll have we be in, especially when we're practicing telemetry later. Um, that 163 to 172, those are all federal government. So that's for everything from radio callers that the feds are putting out on wild animals but also anything else that they're trying to do telemetry on, anything else that's uh, sending out those radio signals, those all are fed. Um, so in addition, when you're ordering your frequencies, 
You don't want to duplicate, obviously, uh, have more than one animal with the same frequency, but you also don't want to make them very, too close. You want to have at least 10 uh, kilohertz between your uh, radio tags because radio frequencies actually, um, as the battery ages in a unit, it will actually um, what's called drift. So you might start off at something at like 163.002 and you go back and it's the next time it's at one you know 1.015 um and so you want to make sure that you don't have them bleeding into each other i also generally do not put ra rabbits or any radios that are super close together um near i don't deploy them near each other so for my um research i had three different populations of marsh rabbits and so if I had radio tags that were pretty close together um, in that spectrum, I made sure that I put them in totally different um, populations so that there was no chance I was ever going to have any um, bleed over or confusion. Uh, the same thing with uh, easily confusable numbers. As we've all learned, um, I'm not great with numbers. Everybody is not great with numbers. It's really easy to switch numbers up in your head when you write them down. Um, so I always separate easily confusable numbers. I would never put um, like the 131 in the same area as the 113, for example, just so it's really obvious what you're tracking and you can't uh, make a mistake when you write it down because a rabbit isn't going to move between those two populations. And so if one of my technicians wrote down that they were, um, you know, looking for, you know, 131, and I knew that it wasn't there, it really helps. Um, so those are just some thoughts to keep in mind when you're thinking about um, what frequency you're gonna use to track your animals. So all VHF and really all radio collars can have a lot of um, accessories and add-ons. So you can add on a mortality switch that works whenever um, an animal is inactive for a long period of time. Uh, it depends upon your species, but most animals kind of move around even in their sleep. Um, so if an animal is inactive for, say, up to four hours, you can set it so that it will switch to mortality. And that way, um, usually it just doubles the pulse rate. And so you can know right away that it's on mortality and you can home to that animal and find out what happened to it. Um, a similar sensor is the activity sensor. So if the radio is really getting jostled, it'll change that um, pulse rate <coughs> so that you can tell that the animal is moving when you're tracking it. And this can help um, with you interpreting your uh, telemetry data. You can also get temperature loggers. Um, you can get ones that will detect hibernation and actually slow the pulse rate and save battery during hibernation. We can get altitude. Um, some of the tags that you put on aquatic animals, they can get pressure, um, so you can figure out how, where in the water column they were. So there's a lot of options. Um, all these things, of course, are going to add expense to your radio collar, and also they're not foolproof. So all of these things can potentially fail. So once you pick out a radio, you need a radio collar, you need to pick up a receiver, something to actually get that um, information back. Um, and they would pick up the signal, they reject all the other noise, reject other signals that are not specific to the one that you're tuned into, um, and they reject extra noise. And so the what we're talking about is the sensitivity and the specificity. So you want to be sensitive, you want to be able to pick up your radio, but you also want to be able to like kind of filter out all the other stuff that's in the environment that's making a lot of noise. Um, and that's where the kind of the cost of this comes in. Um, this boxy one is called an R1000. That's kind of the Nokia phone of the receiver world. I have beat mine, um, beat mine up quite a bit, but it still works. However, it's not as specific and you might not get as good of a reading as one of these more expensive um, TRX 1000s. Uh, you can also have a receiver that'll pick up your GPS um, points and do a remote download, for example.
So once you settle on a receiver, you're going to need to choose an antenna. Uh, there are two basic types of antenna. We have directional antennas and omnidirectional antennas. Uh, the directional antennas help you actually locate where the signal is coming from. Um, it'll show you the direction that the signal is coming in. And there are two types of those that we're going to kind of see in class. You have the H antenna, which is this one. Um, it's on, on the bottom right-hand side. And it's two elements that are look like an H. Um, alternatively, alternatively, you can have a Yagi, which have more elements. Uh, this is a three element Yagi and and they are actually more accurate and they have a little bit more power in picking up signals that are further away. Um, I like H antennas because these actually can come in foam so and they also screw in so these are a little bit more easy to fix. Once you kind of start bending the elements of your Yagi you're kind of um, out of luck, whereas the H is a little bit easier to, to fix when you break it. And I mean, you're abusing these um, antennas when you're out in the field. If you're going through um, forest and marsh and swamp after animals, these things are gonna get a lot of abuse. Um, so we can also have omnidirectional antennas. Uh, so we have a whip, which is um, basically a straight antenna, kind of like you would put on your car. And often these are mounted to cars. Um, and that will just pick up any signal that's coming anywhere. Um, so it's a little bit better when you're trying to scan for animals and you don't know where they are, uh, but it's not going to tell you which direction those signals were coming from. Along those same lines is the loop antenna, which is uh, this one in the center on the very bottom. Um, they're often used in fisheries research, um, and they're just another type of omnidirectional. They have a lot of power for picking up signals that are coming from any direction, but it's pretty hard to use it to home in on a signal. Now, you connect these um, antennas to your receiver box using a coax cable, um, and it's just important to remember that the coax cable is the weakest part of your system. And so if you get out into the field, and, you're, and you turn on your receiver and nothing is happening, just check your coax cable first. I always carry multiple ones um, in case the one I have is bad. Uh, and it's just the easiest and easiest part to fix and also the, mo the, easiest, the most likely part of your system to fail. Um, so in addition to the VHF callers, we can put GPS collars on animals. And the advantages to GPS collars are that you can just set it and forget it. You can put it on an animal and it's gonna collect data remotely. Um, they are fairly accurate. When you have a good fix, they're gonna get you within five meters of where your animal was. You can also have very consistent data keeping because um, you can actually just set a schedule. They have long battery lives and you can get really fine scale movements. Um, the disadvantages to this is that they are incredibly expensive. So um, a VHF collar for my rabbits is like a hundred bucks. Uh, if we were to have tried to put GPS collars on them, it could have cost us upwards of um, 1500. Um, and so these bigger units for things like moose and wolves, they can be $2,500. Um, and so obviously, if you have something that expensive, it's going to eat away at your sample size. Um, you won't be able to deploy as many of these kinds of radios. So it's a, it's your individual number of animals is going to go down. Um, also, it's important to remember that uh, ac they may not be as accurate as you think. Um, behavior and habitat will influence your fix success. So if your animal goes into a den goes into like a really dense forest, you might lose um, the fix. So you might think that the animal's not using those habitats, but it's just that the GPS can't get um, the signal in there. This is something they've shown, they've seen a lot with the pythons. Water apparently really att attenuates, it blocks the uh, radios, the GPS, GPS fixes when they're hauled out onto a road or a um, canal. And so that's not really helpful if we can't track them through the entirety of the environment. Also, 
GPSs can be very difficult because they often are required, they often need to store the information in the actual collar. So you need to get that collar back to extract that information. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about GPS collars and specifically how to offload them. Um, so sometimes you can just plan on the radio collar dropping off. You can either recapture the animal or you can put a mechanism on it that uh, has an automatic drop off. So after a couple week, after a couple years, it'll drop off naturally. Some of them have a a trigger. You can actually just trigger the drop off. However, as Dawn was, I know, mentioned to a couple of you guys, those don't always work. So you think you're gonna be able to tell the radio when to drop off, um, but then it just doesn't and it stays on the animal and so you're not getting your data back. So to get around that, uh, there are a couple different ways we can work on it. Um, there are what are called UHF collars, which allow for a remote download. So maybe once a month, the UA UHF will turn on and start broadcasting all of that locational data. And you need to be within a good range of your animal in order to receive that um, broadcast with the special equipment and download uh, the coordinates off that radio collar. Um, we've also, we already just talked about VHF collar, um, the drop off and recaptures. Um, most, even if it's a UHF collar or a cell phone collar, you're still gonna actually have a VHF transmitter in the collar um, so that you can pick it up later. And also it, VHF is uh, a really robust mechanism. It's a really robust um, technology. So it's not going, it's very unlikely to fail. Whereas these more um, advanced technologies are, we're still working the bugs out of them. So it's a good fail safe. Um, GPS callers are also now just getting cell phone technology. So if they detect a cell phone tower nearby, they can communicate with it, um, connect to the internet and download the GPS call points that way. Um, however, it's a problem uh, to use this in an area that is remote. However, cell phone reception is getting better in a lot of remote places. So this is becoming more and more um, common. So there's also the satellite tag system. Uh, you can use the Argos satellite system. So there are these um, polar orbiting satellites that can receive signals uh, and they can in real time relay it, download it and relay it to the internet. Um, generally satellite tags can be a lot smaller than um, those GPS tags because you don't need the actual unit um, on the animal. However, their accuracy is not that great and neither is their batter, battery life. Uh, they're also insanely expensive and you have to pay a monthly access fee to be able to um, use those satellite servers. So just like everything in wildlife, there are you know, trade-offs, pluses and minuses, but using any one of these um, systems. And so, you want to think about the question and your animal really carefully when making a decision about what kind of tag you're going to put on. So when you're actually trying to find an animal with your VHF radio, uh, there's three main ways to do it. You can do it via aircraft, via, via homing, or via triangulation. So the most straightforward um, and simplest way of using radio telemetry to find an animal is to home to that animal. Homing is just moving straight towards an animal until you get visual contact or you're sure of its location. You know, you've um, walked around a bush and you know it's in the bush. Um, so the pros of using this method is that you actually get visual contact so you can um, study mortality, uh, nesting, you can find nests this way, and it reduces error. You know the animal is right there. There's no error polygon. Um, however, there are some drawbacks in that you are causing a disturbance. You can um, move, make the animal move away from you as you're trying to track it. Um, and also there's problems with access. Uh, animals can move on a private property and you might not be able to follow them. So you can have data quality issues that way. Uh, so I used homing quite a bit in my master's research in the Everglades. 
I put radio collars on marsh rabbits and reintroduced them into the Everglades and tracked them every day. Um, and most of the time I was doing triangulation, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but every couple of days I, I wanted to do um, wellness checks to make sure they were still alive. I did have mortality sensors on these animals, but I was worried that some of their primary predators wouldn't trip the mortality sensor. So I would um, home to each rabbit every every three days to get eyes on it. And sometimes I would be homing and instead of a rabbit, um, I would follow that signal to a Burmese python because pythons um, eat the rabbit whole, um, radio collar and all. So that transmitter is coming from the belly of a python. Um, the pythons also don't trip the mortality sensor because the python is still moving. So that sensor isn't necessarily going to be um, uh, still for that four hours it takes to trip the sensor. Um, this snake here actually was was captured for me by a friend. I, I am not a, a snake expert uh, by any means. I'm a mammal person. And so this I was tracking this rabbit in um, this portion of the Everglades and I got pretty deep. I was probably waist deep water and I was realizing that I kept losing it. I would be very close and then the animal would just disappear. And I very quickly realized that, okay, this is probably not a rabbit. I would hear it splash away from me. This is probably a snake. But part of my project was taking pictures of the snakes so I could see if there are more than one snake eating my rabbits um, and to get a population estimate. Um, however, I was so freaked out by myself, I couldn't get, I couldn't move fast enough to get um, on top of this snake enough to double check that it was 100% a python. So I came back to the road, put all my stuff away, and went and found the park biologist and asked him if he could come catch a snake for me. Um, and he said he couldn't, but he, you know, went and found somebody because it's never too, too hard to get someone to catch a snake for you in the Everglades. Um, and that person came out and within five minutes, uh, they had found, they caught the snake and, uh, that turned out to be a seven foot python, um, the longest and biggest snake in my study. Uh, but yeah, it just shows you that you have to have actually this snake, um, ran away from me for probably 45 minutes. So, uh, you can really move, force some animals to move when you're homing to them. All right, so you can also find your tagged animals via aircraft. Um, you, it's very similar to homing. You have your antenna just mounted on the wings of the airplane and the pilot tips the wings in either direction and you can kind of tell him, okay, it's, it's louder off of the left-hand side. Um, and then they circle to help you uh, locate the animals. Um, but there's a lot of considerations about using aircraft. You got to think about the range of the tag. How far away are you going to be? Are you going to have, how close are you going to be before you pick up the tag? Um, also usually doing a aircraft flight requires, um, flying much lower to the ground than most air pilots are, um, comfortable with. So you need a special pilot and special permission from the FAA. It's also very expensive. Um, it can be hundreds of dollars an hour to rent a plane. Um, you're also going to need uh, radios that have a faster pulse, so it's a little bit easier to find them. You're going to have to use headphones because all of that air, all that, it's so noisy in these aircrafts. Um, and you're going to have to test the accuracy of your system. Uh, this, I, I don't actually like doing telemetry flights anymore. I, I just can't stomach them. I get really nauseous. So I pretty much give them up as yeah, easy, as often as I can. Uh, this pilot is actually named Galen, and he was the pilot for that we worked with at Grand Canyon. Um, to save on the cost of these flights, we often would backpack on other Park Service missions. So if he were going out to... Um, a far off part of the park in order to say resupply one of the rangers there, we would hop on and we would do some telemetry with um, on the way there. If he was doing, he often did like a boundary patrol to see if there were any um, Clive Bundy's cattle uh, incurring on the incurring on the fort on the park. Uh, 
Um, and we would hop in and, and have them track uh, some of our bighorns. Um, those bighorns all had GPS collars, but we often needed to track them using this plane because they, the GPS receiver can't always communicate with the um, satellites because especially places like Grand Canyon where you have those uh, high canyon walls, if they die up in one of those um, tighter spots or if they're up there for a long time, we can lose complete um, contact with the animal. And so we need to fly over them in order to find them. Because um, like we talked about, some of these tags are worth several thousand dollars. So it's pretty critical that we find them um, and go pick them up. So the last way that we can um, find animals using VHF tags is through triangulation. Um, so triangulation is a very remote way of estimating the location of an animal. You don't have to go up to it. You don't have to disturb it. And you use, it's called triangulation because it works best with, with three or more bearings, but two will do. Um, and you're basically just finding, uh, you're usually walking along a trail and finding where, finding the angle that is um, direct towards your animal where that best signal is. And you take um, about two or three readings and where those intersect, that's the probability that that's the area that your animal is probably in. So it can be highly um, inaccurate. So you got to usually calculate an error polygon by using multiple, um, multiple triangulations. Um, and also you want to do this quickly because you don't want your animal to be moving around and really adding a lot of um, error. Um, there are a lot of sources of error, things like signal bounce, signal reflection, um, user error. So it's... Just, it's hard to get right, but once you, it's a steep learning curve and it's hard to get right, but once you get to doing it, it can be really, really useful um, and a quick way to find an animal when you don't have time to home to it. Um, so like I was saying, there's a lot of sources of potential error when you're using triangulation. Um, anything can cause interference, power lines, cars, uh, other radios. When I was in California, I was in kind of Simi Valley and we were in very, very residential areas and lawn mowers and leaf blowers would make my telemetry gear just loot, like go off the charts. Um, the terrain can also reflect and refract your signal. So it can, you can get a lot of bounce. Um, if your animal is in thick vegetation or underwater, you might not be able to find it. Um, wind, like extreme wind might make it really difficult to get an accurate reading. Um, and also power lines can um, give you a false signal. So once we get all these data and we find all of these locational information about the animals, what do we do with them? Well, usually people want to make a home range. Uh, but there's a couple problems with just saying you're going to do a home range estimation. And this is something that I hope that you take from this course is that Home ranges are an area repeatedly traver traversed by an animal during a specific time period, that there is a time associated with that home range because the winter range might be different than the summer range or the breeding range. So it's really important that you remember you're specific with what exact kind of range um, you're talking about. And also what exactly does the size of a home range tell us? How, why is that biologically relevant? Um, it used to be that you could just, you know, slap a radio collar on an animal and publish a paper about how big the home range size is, but that's not all that biologically meaningful or informative um, in and of itself, right? Here's a polygon that shows like, yeah, the animal comes down here sometimes, but that's a pretty... Um, big range, but what does that tell us about what the animal is doing? So there are a lot of other options. Um, so you can look at areas within the home range that the um, animal is using a lot versus areas they're not using. So that's called a resource selection. So it's used versus um, available. You can also look at behavior. So if you put multiple different home ranges all on top of each other, kind of like this picture on the right, you can see if they're territorial, if the animals that you're looking at are territorial, or if they're um, kind of all on top of each other. 
I used home range size or the changes in home range size as an indicator of um, habitat val like habitat quality. The bigger the home range, the more space the rabbits needed in order to get their daily um, nutrients. Um, but just the size of a home range in and of itself is not all that useful. So it's important um, to remember that when we're thinking about ways to use uh, locational data. Um, we can also do just so much other great stuff with locational data. We can um, learn about fecundity, so just through nest checks, because once we have a tag on mom, we can look at, we can watch that nest through time. Um, when you talk to Dawn and you're learning about black bears, we can follow moms to the den, so we can tag the babies and find how many babies survive in it um, for any given year. We can do survival checks. We can learn life expectancy. We can do sources of predation. Um, we can also learn important things about migration. So previously, when you were just banding an animal and you got one or two re, um, recaptures, you know it might say uh, these are. This is a map of snow geese migration, and so you might have, you know, tagged a snow goose in Sacramento and then recaptured it up here near Calgary, but you don't see that there's this very clear um, path that they're traversing and that they have some important stopover areas. And so it might be really important to protect those stopover habitats um, in order to preserve these populations. Um, also understanding migration is important to understand the ecology of animals um, and even these trackers have been used to understand how animals are navigating. Um, they've seen correlations with the magnetic poles um, and different um, um, weather patterns that show that the animals are using um, cues in the environment to get where they're going. So in any study involving telemetry, you do have a few basic assumptions. Um, the first one is that your radio tag does not influence the movement of the animal. Um, so it's not changing those, um, you know, what you're studying. It also does not influence the survival of the animal because you do not want to be making estimates on survival when your tag has reduced survival. You also don't want to boost survival. My roommate Morgan was telling me that there are red-winged blackbirds that seem to actually have better reproductive success when they are tagged with red objects. Um, so you don't want to be doing that in your samples. You also want to have a representative sample. So you want all of your study species that target population to have equal probability of capture. Um, and also you want to have an, a good representation of the sex ratio of all the animals that are out there. Um, this is me, uh, the very first job I had out of undergraduate. I worked out in Montana on a project with wolves. And the person that I was working with told me that he's never seen a, the smart ones. Um, he only ever captures kind of the most common are uh, yearling males who are probably just leaving their packs and are trying to find their own way. And they kind of are willing to take more risks. So they're more likely to get caught. Um, so you just have to be very careful about um, making sure that you have a representative sample of your population. Um, also, you got to be careful about data collection. You can get into some murky territory with some of the this data. Um, sample size is important. Usually, you have to have at least you have to have over 30 points before you can start making um, any estimates on kind of home range use and size. Uh, you also want to use random samples so you want to be able to go get these animals at different times of the day you don't want to just look at what is my fox squirrel doing at three in the morning because fox squirrels are sleeping so they'll be in their den you'll think that they're not going anywhere when it's much better to look at them on a random schedule um, so that you're representing all those different times of the day um, and also just like with all of our studies you want to make sure you have independent samples um, and so you, usually locational data is uh, autocorrelated. Where you are right now is highly correlated with where you will be five minutes from now. So usually what we say in um, wildlife ecology is that locations are not, are not autocorrelated 
If enough time has passed, then an animal can traverse its whole range and then come back. And so we usually say that's about one day, but that changes based upon the animal that you're studying and also the question that you have. Um, and to kind of wrap up, you always want to uh, test your equipment before releasing an animal. You want to make sure your radio is on. Um, I've heard horror stories. Uh, when radios are shipped, they're usually magnet um, turned on or turned off. And so I've heard horror stories where graduate students forget to take the magnet off of the radio and they send an animal off with a $2,000 radio tag that's not on. Um, you also want to make sure that your receiver and all of your equipment is working so that when you say you don't hear um, your animal, you're really not missing them. Um, radio telemetry, the proper use of it, has a steep learning curve, but once you get it, it's a very good use. Um, it's a good a way to get good locational data. Um, but it's also important to understand that it's not a panacea. It's not the end all be all. It's incredibly expensive. It's really invasive. It's highly time consuming. So you need a clear justification for using this technology. Um, for example, for my PhD research, I didn't put a radio collar on a single animal. I'm looking at the interactions between gray squirrels and fox squirrels. And I decided that, yeah, I could put radio collars on a bunch of fox squirrels and, and see if, they're, if their movements change when I moved the gray squirrels that were in their kind of home ranges. But it was just as easy and um, defensible to use cameras to study that, um, to see the increase or decrease of um, activity based upon my treatment. Uh, so it's not always necessary to put a tag on an animal. Um, and it's always good to think outside of the box and be more creative um, when you don't and not use this technology. Um, so in sum summary, we went over that radio telemetry is any time that you're putting a, um, a tag on an animal that is transmitting information back to you. Um, we use it when we want to be able to locate animals in real time, um, and we want to avoid any effects on the animals. Um, we use a lot, a wide variety of different tags and receivers, but they all have the basic same components of a radio, a transmitter, and a battery. Um, we can find animals by homing to them or using triangulation. Uh, and you guys are going to be doing both of those um, uh, tracking mechanisms uh, this week in lab. Uh, finally, there are a lot of things that we can do with the data, um, but it's not an end-all be-all. And there's a lot of study considerations that you have to take into effect uh, before you use uh, radio telemetry as a tool. So I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in lab and in discussion, and I'll see you on Thursday.